Go ahead and uh, have a seat, and as you're doing that, why don't you grab your Bibles? I'd like you to uh, find the book of Psalm, Psalm 100, a beautiful psalm that we're going to be studying together today. We're in a series that we started last week called Shattered. We might think of the postscript as yet unshaken. We're looking at life scenarios that leave us shattered, and we're learning how, even in the midst of those life circumstances, when we might feel absolutely shattered, yet we are learning how to be unshaken. And isn't that, isn't that the mark of maturity? Isn't that the mark that we are growing in the Lord when something shatters us but we remain unshaken, that it doesn't steal our joy so many times in our immaturity and our walk with the Lord. Simple things could steal our joy, but as we grow in Him and as we walk with Him, as even things get harder and harder and we find ourselves even in circumstances well beyond our imagination, we we realize even that can't steal our joy. And we learned last week uh, a definition that was uh, relatively new to me. Uh, I love this definition of joy, a confident assurance that God is in control and what he is doing is best, which tells us that regardless of the circumstance and regardless of the mess it might be and the mess it might be making in our life, that we have this confident assurance that God is the one who's in control and He is doing what is best. He didn't consult me. I was not invited to the meeting. He chose the course for me and I have a confident assurance. But how can we be unshaken even when we're shattered? We're learning that as we work through the Scriptures together. Last week we looked at what I think is very important and that in many of our lives we experience. I experience it in my life, you experience it in your life, and that's shattered relationships. And we learned, okay, well, what's the process to reconciliation? How do we go through this in such a way as to honor the Lord, even though someone may have wounded us deeply? Now today, we're going to shift gears slightly. I actually was going to take us back to Philippians and continue on in the pursuit of understanding joy in difficult circumstances, but I was leading the pastors through a time of prayer, and we worked through Psalm 100, and I just had this impression from the Lord that it wasn't done, and I went back and I was studying it more, and as I was unearthing it, I thought, I need the congregation to see this and its depth and its beauty and its richness, and I think it fits because the topic that I I had felt as if the Lord was calling me to speak about was one that we don't often talk about in churches. And I think this is sad because I think many of us experience this and this is a, uh, this is a, a, a shattered emotional state, being emotionally shattered. And I, I, and I realize it comes at different levels. Many of us have experienced moments because of circumstances where we just feel a wreck inside emotionally. But then there's a whole other group who, as pastors, we regularly encounter as part of our body who would say uh, they are emotionally very fragile and they don't know why. And and, 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 And many times they can't even explain the area they just, they just, as they've grown older, they feel it more and more intense. And, and the church doesn't often address these inner feelings of kind of emotional instability. We just say things, you know, like when someone asks you, well, how are you doing? I hate that. I'm, I'm, we lie to each other. Fine. Stop making me lie to you. 
we got to find a different question to ask one another, you know? I mean, because many of, many of us, you know, at times we'll go through and we'll be like, we just feel fragile. And I was thinking about that. Uh, some time ago, my, par- my, my, my kids and my wife um, got me a great gift. They uh, gave me a day, half a day, at uh, the Akron Glassworks, and I got to go and blow glass and make different things and make a couple spheres. And um, it was a wonderful experience. I love those kind of things, working with my hands and and uh, trying new arts, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. This is not one of them. This is done by someone who is much more skilled than I uh, am, and, but it's very thin. You can't tell that, but it's very thin, and the glass comes up from the middle, and it's very, very fragile. You think I'm going to drop this, <laughs> don't you? You think I'm just going to, I'm not going to, no, that was last week. This is this week. All right, no. The, 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 but this is, this is just, and in, in many ways, this is a lot like how some of you feel on the inside. I get that. You, you, you don't really understand why, but there are just times when you feel very fragile. And that if something puts some pressure, or if you see something, or you experience something, or something drops, it's going to shatter, and you're just going to be a mess. And what causes that? How do we move through it? Well, the beautiful thing is you're not alone. You're with an entire community of people, and some of of you within this community have walked that path, and you are walking that path, and you join willingly with others. Some of you have come over through that, and, and you say, I will walk alongside. We have the comfort of Scripture where the the church and the people of God of the past have felt this way. We have wonderful examples. Isn't it beautiful that we have a book filled with people who are real? I, I love to read the Psalms and David who's so real. He says, my spirit was overwhelmed inside of me. He's, he's, he, as well as he can often articulate things in, in, in few of the Psalms, he almost trips over his own words because it, you can feel the inner tension and this fragileness of this man. Job said, I'm not at ease. I, I have no rest. Elijah was depressed. Jonah was anger, angry. Moses was betrayed. Jeremiah struggled with lonesomeness. What do we do? What do we do when we have these internal feelings? Well, I, I'm going to teach you a principle that sounds absolutely counterintuitive. It's not my principle. It's Scripture's principle. It's God's principle. And so we need to take good note of this. If this was just my principle, it would be man's wisdom. You didn't come to hear man's wisdom. You didn't come to hear psychology. You came to hear, well, what does God tell me in these times? See, I could give you all kinds of pop psychology to tell you what you could do to soothe it, but it would be temporary and it would be non-effective. But if we listen to what God has to say, even if it's counterintuitive to what we might think we should do or want to do, if it's, if, if it's what God tells us to do and we boldly do it, we find the results will be exactly what he has predicted, that he will move us through those troubled waters. You say, all right, well, what's this principle? All right, the principle is this. You might want to write it down. When, and you could fill in the blank, when I feel sad or when I'm lonely or when I'm fearful or when I'm unsure or when I'm shattered, I rejoice in the Lord. That's it. Very simple. 
When I'm feeling these, this way, when I'm feeling these feelings, I rejoice in the Lord. Now we go back to Scripture and we find out this is exactly what the people of God practiced. Following the prompting of the Spirit of God, this is what they practiced. Job said, even though he slay me, what? I will hope in him. David, psalm after psalm, pours out his heart, sometimes even complaining, even lamenting. And at the end of the psalm, almost every single one, he ends praising God, rejoicing in God. Jeremiah, he's in a cistern, and the cistern, which normally held water, has turned to mud. He's lowered down into this. He's up to his waist and maybe even up to his chest in mud. And he's thinking, this might be my entire life. And yet this is when God reveals to him and says to him, Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. See, we always take that out of context. Jeremiah was in the depth of despair and loneliness, and God comes and interjects a future, and what does Jeremiah do? He begins to praise God. And then we have Habakkuk. We studied Habakkuk a few years ago. What a tremendous book. And do you remember what Habakkuk did? Habakkuk was facing annihilation and total invasion by the Babylonians. And he's having this dialogue back and forth with God, and finally he relents. He actually, he actually follows the call of God. And he says in chapter 3, though the fig trees should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, and the produce of the olives fail, and the fields yield no fruit, and the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall. Even though there's this catastrophic economic collapse, yet, yet, he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. What is that? That's even though blank, I will rejoice in the Lord. You, you say, well, why, why do we praise God when we're shattered? Because, I'll tell you why, because it overpowers the circumstance. It overpowers the emotions that are welling up inside you. I'll tell you why. It reminds you of what you know rather than what you are feeling. And so, what does God call us to do? He says, praise me. Praise me even in the midst of being shattered. This is why I brought you to this wonderful little psalm, Psalm 100. It's only five verses, but it's filled with such wisdom and depth. It will encourage you, but I want it to sink down deep. So we're going to read this, all five verses, together as a congregation. I'm reading out of the ESV. It will be on the screen behind me if you do not have this translation. In honor of what God has written and in honor of who he is, I think it would be appropriate for us to stand. So let's, if you are able, sensitive always of that, will you stand and let's read this together beginning in verse 1. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endure forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Can you say amen to that? Amen. amen. All right, go ahead and have a seat. I want you to see just a few things before we dive down. We're going to look at seven actions for shattered 
emotions. Where do I get these seven actions? Because there are seven imperatives buried in the text. Seven imperatives from God. Make, serve, come, know, enter, give, bless. All the way from verse 1 through verse 4, there are seven imperatives. Make, serve, come, know, enter, give, bless. Then there are four approaches to God with gladness, with singing, with thanksgiving, with praises. That's how we approach God. Then there are three qualities about God at the end of the psalm, verse 5. God is good. He has steadfast love. That's the hesed love. That is the love of God that is ultimately faithful, never ending. And then he is faithful throughout all generations. That's the psalm in a nutshell. It's often referred to as a practical or practice psalm. Why is that? It's because it shows us how to practice the worship of God. That's what we want. I want to know what it is that God wants. I want to know, God, what do you want when I come to worship you? I, I don't want to come guessing, and I don't want to come just thinking, all right, I'll make up. I'll make it up what, what I might think is best. No, I, I don't want that. I want to know, God, what is it that you want when I come to worship you? And so he tells us, and so this is often called a practice psalm. It's also called an entrance psalm. And this is a psalm where uh, the worshipers would, would sing this psalm or would chant this psalm before entering the sanctuary. And what we do is we just simply follow the imperatives. Now, there are some times when I, when I go and I'm, I'm working through a message, and excuse me, ladies, for the analogy, but it's like giving birth. You know, it's, it's just like, it's hard. I mean, there's labor involved in it. It's not easy, and, and it takes hours, and it takes prayer, and it takes waiting for the Lord, and it, and it takes patience, and it takes going back to the text. That was not the case. This just kind of fell out. And it was, it, it was like I could, I could not write fast enough. I could not think fast enough. It was this, the Spirit was ahead of me. And why? It's because it's God's outline. All I have to do is I just have to follow God's outline, and so that's what we're going to do. We're following God's outline. Seven imperatives equals seven actions for shattered emotions. So follow with me. We'll start in verse 1. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to make a joyful noise. That's what I want you to do. You want, you feel shattered inside? You want to feel stable even in the midst of that? Make a joyful noise. You say, all right, well, what does joyful noise mean? Because we can read that all throughout the Scriptures, don't we? And you can go from passage to passage to passage through the psalm, then out of the psalm, and you'll find God telling us to make a joyful noise. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, we don't have to go very far, actually, to see a definition. I actually don't even have to turn the page. Psalm 98, we get a definition how to make a joyful noise. Now, I'm going to just start in verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. That alone is the foundation. We're going to come back to that. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered the steadfast, here it is, hesed, love. It means an unfailing love. It'll never fail. It'll always be there. A steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Now verse 4. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. How do I do that? He tells us, break forth into joyous song and singing praise. There it is. How do I make a joyful noise? I sing songs of praise. He keeps going, sing praises to the Lord with the lyre. Okay, well, so now I'm to use some type of instrumentation with the lyre and the sound of melody with the trumpet. So here's another piece of instrumentation. So you, you're getting the sense, the sound of the horn. Uh, that's the bagpipes. Make a <laughs> joyful noise before the king, the Lord. So this is the call for us to uh, make a, a, a joyful noise with our mouth, with our singing, and with our 
uh, ability to create instruments and instrumentation. Now, if we do not do that, if we're unwilling to do that, look, let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. You hear what he's saying? He's saying, look, if, if my people won't do it, my creation will do it for me. And so I'm calling my people to join in with my creation, to join in this chorus of noisy worship, of praise to the God of who, who is the creator of the universe. It is, a, it is a coming together, a chorus of creation and created to sing praises to our God. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I love to be in the woods early, early, early in the morning. So I love, I love to be a hunter. I can, I can crawl in there early before the sun comes up, before anything is stirring. It's dark. Nothing's moving. And you wait. And right before the sun comes up, the temperature drops. And then the sun pops up over, starts the crest of the hill, and you feel the warmth of its rays. And the first sound of, are the birds. It's always the birds. They're waking up. And then there's the ground critters. They're starting to move around, the squirrels and such. Often the waterfowl will fly overhead. Turkeys are leaving their roost, coming down to the ground. The deer, who are mostly nocturnal animals, are coming out of the fields and they're creeping back into the woods to find their bedding for the day. And all these sounds, you start to hear the fish begin to rise out of the water as the sun breaks across and warms the top of the water. All these sounds, and these are what? The sounds of creation bringing glory to the Creator. You see, He calls us as His created. He says, don't let them outdo you. And so what is He saying? He's basically calling for noisy worship. Sometimes when we feel emotionally shattered, it's often because of what's been done to us. The psalmist tells us to focus on what's been done for us. Will you notice verse 1 of Psalm 98? Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Is there a witness of someone in the house that God has done marvelous things for you? Yes. So you come and you're ready to sing to him. Now, I can already hear, I can hear people saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but worship should be reverent. And reverent often equals silent. So just as you know, uh, reverence is used three times in the entire Scripture. The word reverent, three times in the entire Bible. Worship with noise, 110 times. Singing, 115 times. Praise, 207 times. Shout, 49 times. What do you think God wants from his people? Now, there's nothing wrong with sitting in times of reverence and silence, but the overwhelming majority of time when we gather together, what is it, not that we want, what is it that God wants? God wants to know we are alive and we are joyful for the marvelous things that he has done. Amen? And so he wants to hear us in our praise. Now, I get it, I get it, I get it. And I'm part of this. There is this self-centered reserve within me, within all of us, that often the reason that keeps us from making joyful noise is we fear that we might appear to others as maybe a little bit undignified, or maybe we appear a little fanatical. You know, I, I, I want to implore you to push past that. 
in this environment, it's okay to clap your hands. It's okay to sing loudly. I, I do not have a great singing voice, so they don't give me a microphone for a reason. <laughs> And we don't give some of you a microphone for a reason. <laughs> but you're the bride of Christ. He wants to hear his bride sing to the bridegroom. He thinks your voice is beautiful. So let him hear your voice. Let him hear the clap of your hand. And if you feel the need to raise your hand, and in praise give exaltation to him, and that's not something you've ever done, but you're sensing, I would love to do that, but I don't know, I don't know what others would think of me. Close your eyes and pretend they're not there, and it's just him in the room. I give you permission. You can do that here. Now listen, listen. In some environments, sometimes people do some crazy things, you know? Uh, uh, they'll take off and they'll like start this march and they'll do these. And I think, was it you, uh, Tim? You, I think you said something like, you're very comfortable with weird, right? Yeah. And yeah, so, uh, and uh, I love that. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm comfortable with weird. Um, but there's also this understanding, especially when it comes out of Scripture, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, there's this idea that we don't see chaos in worship, all right? We don't see this sense of hysterical emotionalism or this bizarre activity. We do, do see the unleashing of the Spirit, and in, in some cultures, that manifests itself in different ways. And I'm not judging those ways. Don't hear me judge those ways. I'm not. That, that's their, they have a culture, and, and, and if I'm a part of that culture, I'm okay, even if it's weird. I'll join in. I, I'll get in the march. I'll, hey, if, if, we're, if we're proclaiming Jesus Christ, I want to be there. But that's not necessarily our culture. And so you have to figure out, okay, well, what's, what's the culture here? I'm telling you, here's the culture. You can sing loudly. You can clap triumphantly. You can praise joyfully. You can raise your hand in glory to Jesus Christ. You can praise Him. You see, you are welcomed to worship and make a joyful noise. This is not a place of silence. The key is always this. A joyful noise does not draw attention to the noise maker. A joyful noise does not draw attention to the noise maker. I join in with my brothers and sisters in a chorus of praise. That's a joyful noise. Now, the psalmist continues, and he says this. Look at it. It's in the latter half of verse 2. He says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Now, do you see the word gladness? That's the word joy or rejoicing or pleasure. So I say it this way. Serve rejoicing. It's a redundancy of ideas. That's what the psalmist wants. The idea is the expression of joy. So he's just told us to make a joyful noise. Now he's telling us to, to serve rejoicing, to serve in joy. Now let me just stop for a moment. Do you understand that the king of the universe, the cosmos, has commissioned you to serve? We've got to get this out of the way first. All right? If you're not serving, that's a problem because the king has commissioned you, has gifted you for a job, for a duty to serve. It's my job, it's our job as pastors to help prepare you through life to grow into maturity to face the king face to face. The last thing we would want is for you to stand before Jesus and to say, uh, yeah, uh, I was too busy to serve you. Wrong answer. You've been commissioned to serve. Are you serving? So you need to check the box, 
Yes. Now, it's not just here within the body. You can serve. We have multiple partners. You can serve uh, in multiple ways. But you need to be able to say, yes, I clearly have identified how I'm serving, and I'm serving the Lord in this way. Now, the second part, are you doing it joyfully? Because in the act of joy is the act of praise. We have a volunteer, I won't mention her name, she serves here, and every now and then I'll catch her, she'll be walking down the hallway and she'll be singing. And it's a beautiful thing, it makes me smile. She brings this effervescent sense of joy here. Because, you see, it reflects, this joy is your attitude, it reflects the honor you're giving to the one who's called you to serve. The next thing that the psalmist calls us to do, verse 2, is to come ready to sing. Do you see this? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Did you come today ready to sing? Are you in your seat ready for corporate worship? when it's time to sing, "Uh uh-oh, he's stepping on my toes. Uh Uh-oh, are you here when the service starts or are you rushing around to get here? I don't like the sound of this. He sounds like he's talking right to me. I'm not talking right to you. I don't even know if you come late or not. You know why? Because I'm here down here, my back's to you. I'm already worshiping. But if you're late, you're missing the most important appointment of your week. You're meeting with the God of your salvation. You say, but I got caught in the hallway and I got caught in a conversation. You've got six and a half other days to have that conversation. I'm all about community, have it after the service. It's not rude to say to them, I gotta go, I got an appointment with God. That might stop a conversation in the middle of the hallway at church. (laughs) Now listen, if we're doing something here in our children's ministry or our youth ministry or in our ABFs and you're saying, you guys are just making it hard for us, we can't get from point A to point B, let us know about it and we'll fix it. But if you're late because you can't get here because of some timing issue, I want to implore you, would you bring that before the Lord? I'm not here, really, to make you feel guilty or to judge you for that. I'm just telling you, it sets your week of priorities in line when you say, I'm putting God first. I'm joining the people of God. The service starts at 1040. I'm going to be there and ready to sing. Why? Because he told me in his word that's what he wants from me. And there's something that goes on. Yeah, but I don't want to be there. I just don't emotionally feel like I can get there. I just, I don't, it's come anyways. Because when you do, you're practicing the principle of rejoicing in the Lord. Make a joyful noise, serve rejoicing, come ready to sing. Now, we're in verse 3, an incredible verse. I wish we had more time to unpack it, so we're going to do just a very quick tour through verse 3. Notice this. It says, know that the Lord, I'm going to give you a pre, I'm giving you, I'm giving you a little hint. There's an amen opportunity coming. (laughs) All right. Know that the Know that the Lord, He is God. Amen. Okay, you're catching on. <laughs> know that the Lord, He is God. Amen. Right. Why? No. What's He saying? Know that God is God. That's what He's saying. And then He, he tells us why. It is He who made us. I love this. I have nothing against science. I love science. I love to think critically. But I have a different worldview than science. Uh, I have a tendency to believe that man is fallible, makes mistakes, and God is infallible, doesn't make mistakes. 
And when God says he made me, I believe he actually is the creator. I don't think we came through some other method. I'm waiting for a man and science to catch up to God, not the other way around. That's my worldview. And this is why, because it, it tends to stack on top of each other. If I know who made me, then I know the purpose of my life, and I know who I belong to. So look, what does it say? Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. Do you remember on 1 Peter 2, 9, it says you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You, 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 a God who, who allows nature to take its own path and creates out of some random sense of choices wouldn't say something like this. But a God who says, I've made you, and not only did I make you, I've chosen you, and you're my royal priesthood, you're my holy nation, you're a people of my own possession, and I've made you for a purpose so you can proclaim the excellencies of him who called you, what? Out of darkness out of your lostness, into a marvelous light. It goes back to Psalm 90, uh, 98.1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done what? Say it. Marvelous things. Isn't that amazing? Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people. If you kept reading in Peter, it would say, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. I love this. It's just all the while supporting make a joyful noise, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing, know that God is God. Now, let's pause uh, let's pause from the text for a moment. Uh, let's get some interaction going. What, answer this question in your mind, what living person would you like to meet? What living person would you like to meet? I'm not doing it today. Someday I'm coming into the balcony. I just am <laughs> too tired today. But someday, what living person would you like to meet? Baker Mayfield. <laughs> Browns quarterback, babe. Cleveland Browns quarterback. I was going to say, yeah. Browns quarterback? Okay. <laughs> Baker Mayfield. All right. You look scared. I'm not going to talk to you. Uh, who, uh, living person that you'd like to meet? Uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump. All right. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I know Hannah. Hannah, who would you like to meet? Uh, probably Joanna Gaines. Joanna! I like Joanna Gaines. I'd, I'd rather meet Chip, but I think if you meet Chip, you got to meet Joanna. They're kind of both. All right, so we got, uh, we got a few important people here. So here's the question. If I could set this up tomorrow, 11 a.m., you were going to meet these people. Would there be a growing anticipation tonight? What would your attitude be like? Would you bring a gift? Now with that set in your mind, come to verse 4. Enter his gates. By the way, the gates. Those big doors over there, those big we got to do something about those doors. Those big doors that look like gates that are keeping people out of the church. we got to make those glass or something. But those, yeah, those are, the, you know, basically it's, he's saying, church doors, those are my doors. Enter his gates with what? It says, thanksgiving and his courts with what? Praise, give thanks to him, bless his name. What does that sound like to you? Enter, give Bless. All of these have to do with attitude and action. You see, if you were going to meet these people tomorrow at 11, you would have a certain attitude. You would have certain actions. 
have all this lined up and prepared, you're meeting some very important, influential people. You know, you know, where, I'm, you know where I'm going, don't you? Is this your attitude when you enter the gates? Number five, enter worship thankful. Before we enter, here's what we do, beloved. We adjust our attitude to the one we are meeting. If it takes a moment in the car, get my attitude right. If it's Saturday night, I can't go out. I just have got to get my heart right. I have an important meeting tomorrow morning. If it's getting up early, whatever it takes so that you can enter worship thankfully. Number six, then what do you do? You give thanks to God. You see, because your attitude has already been prepped, now your actions are gonna follow. You are set, you are ready, you're in your seat, you're anticipating, you're waiting for it to begin, because why? You're ready to give thanks to your God. And that's what he's called you for. And then number seven, you bless God's holy name. You bless his name. You say, what's that mean? How do I bless God? I thought God blessed me. I was always confused by this. Bless is another term in the Old Testament for praise. I come praising God's name. The psalmist has just done a full circle. Did you sense that? This is all about coming to praise God. Now, don't miss this. Why do we do this? Because verse 5, the threefold qualities of God. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love, has said, the unfailing, never changing, never going to change, never going to quit. He's never going to run out on you. He's never, ever, ever going to stop loving you. The steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. He was faithful to my great-grandfather. He's faithful to my grandmother. He's faithful to my mother and father. He's faithful to me. He's faithful to you. This is our God. You say, all right. Will this change my circumstance? No. Will this maybe change that shattered, fragile feeling inside? Maybe not. But I'll tell you what it will do. It will create an unshakable knowledge in you of the trustworthiness of your God and the joy that he gives to you will be unshakable. You say, well, why is that? Because you've acted upon what you know to be true and what he calls of you. You've acted on the scriptural principle of rejoicing in God. I'm going to leave you with this. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might. He increases strength. Even young men, even the youth, shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they, that's you, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What's that sound like? That sounds like a God who pursues us with his love. In shattered, broken, fragile experiences of life, he calls on us to praise him. And in that praising, what does he do? He sets 
our soul on unshakable, stable ground. Oh God, we have no other recourse now but to come back to you and to praise you and to thank you. What a God you are that pursues us. That gives us a love that's far beyond what we can imagine. May we not be so carried away by the winds of our emotions that we forget the truth that comes blaring from the Word of God, of who we are and who you are and what you are doing in our lives. And may those who sit among us, who feel fragile and maybe even shattered this morning, feel the Spirit within them rising because of the praises that they have sung to you, O oh God. And like a balm covering over, perhaps not changing or shifting the mood or the feeling, nonetheless, a quiet, confident assurance that a God who loves them and pursues them is planting them on unshakable, solid ground in the praiseworthy name of Jesus Christ. This has been a message from The Chapel in Akron, Ohio. For more information about The Chapel or to listen to more of these types of life-applicable messages, please go to our website at thechapel.life.